Headless Leper by Frederick Cowles Nearly fifteen years have passed since I first visited the little ruin around which this story centres. I was then a lad of thirteen, rather quieter than most boys are at that age, and given much to wandering away on solitary rambles. I was on a visit to my grandparents, who lived in a little East Anglian market town, and one day I left the place by a road which was new to me. The outskirts of the town were squalid and dirty. A huge clay pit yawned by the roadside, but in the distance I could see meadows golden with buttercups and hedges white with may. The highway led over a railway bridge, on the other side of which I was surprised to see a tiny ruined chapel standing alone in a field. To the casual wayfarer there would be nothing untoward in this event. But to my romantic mind, the sight of the lonely ruin became a great adventure, a living link with the historic past. My imagination soon reared a stately abbey around the little chapel, and it was with an eager thrill in my heart I climbed the fence which separated the field from the main road. Once in the meadow, the sordid realities became more apparent, for by the east wall of the building was a pigsty and the chapel itself was evidently used as a barn. I tried the door, but it was locked. The long, narrow windows were beyond my reach. But I was determined to see the interior of the chapel, and so walked round to investigate. On the north side was a haystack, and by climbing on a part where the hay had been cut away, I found I could see through a window above the choir. At first I could see little, but as my eyes became more accustomed to the gloom, I was able to make out a few trusses of hay on the floor. There also seemed to be the remains of a stone altar. What a pity, I thought, that such a delightful little chapel should be so desecrated. It was pleasant on the haystack, and I must have been rather tired after my walk. I settled down and made myself so comfortable that I was soon asleep. When I awakened, the sun had set and it was already twilight. I was just preparing to descend from my couch, when I smelt a most offensive odour. At first I thought it came from a pigsty, but no pigsty on this earth could ever smell so utterly foul and corrupt. Soon I discovered that the odour appeared to come from the chapel, and, boy-like, I put my head through the window to see what it could be. The smell was certainly inside, a sickly, nauseous stench that almost made me faint. I was turning to the fresh air again when I thought I saw something move in the semi-darkness of the chapel. I looked again, half fascinated, half afraid, and saw that something was certainly moving. What I had previously taken to be trusses of hay were men, in soiled yellow robes, and they knelt on the hard floor, with heads bowed. I looked towards the east end of the building, and there, to my amazement, two candles were burning on the altar, and before it stood a vested priest. He knelt on one knee as I watched him, and lifted high above his head the white wafer of the Eucharist. In the chapel, the heads of the yellow-robed men bowed even lower, and as they moved, little bells tinkled. I looked for the bells and found they were attached by cords to the necks of the worshippers. The priest again prostrated himself, and again rising, lifted the silver chalice that all might adore. Again came the doleful sound of the tuneless bells tinkling in the shadows. Suddenly, one of the bowed figures scrambled to its feet and moved towards the window by which I stood. Terror filled my heart, but I was rooted to the spot. The figure came nearer to me and raised its hand to the window sill, and they were white, like white clay, and their whiteness was a mass of living sores. 
great sickness made me dizzy, and I looked down. Then my heart seemed to stop beating, for my eyes beheld the greatest horror of all. The figure before me was headless. With a wild yell, I fled from the terrible scene, but something followed me through the little meadow and down the main road, almost to my very door. A thing with terrible white hands and no head. Long after I had been safely sitting by the fire in my grandparents' home, the nameless horror haunted me, and in bed that night I hid my head under the clothes and dared not look out. Even in the years that followed, the terror still haunted my dreams, and I no longer went alone into the country. It was twelve years later when I visited the little town again. My grandparents had both died and I stayed with some old friends. The terrible experience of my boyhood was only a hazy memory, and the town held no unpleasant associations. One of my friends, knowing my taste for archaeology, took me to visit most of the churches in the vicinity, and it was near the end of my stay when he informed me I was to see that day a gem of Norman work, an old chapel, recently restored for worship. As we passed out of the town, the road seemed to be vaguely familiar. Near the roadside was a great lake, and my friend informed me that this had once been a clay pit, but had had to be abandoned as the water rose so rapidly. Some memory stirred, but even then I did not realise to where we were going until we actually stood before the little chapel in which I had seen terrifying apparition. Twelve years previously. It was, as my friend had said, the perfect specimen of Norman architecture. It had been refitted for worship in a modest way, but none of its charm had been destroyed. By the way, I inquired, is this one of the chapels of a great monastery? Good Lord, no, was the matter-of-fact reply. I thought you knew. It is the chapel of the leper hospital of St. Mary of Pity. As my friend spoke, I felt a feeling of fear and nausea coming over me. With a great effort, I managed to shake off the feeling and advanced to the altar rails. I stopped just at the entrance of the sanctuary to inspect the choir arch. My friend was looking at some inscription at the back of the chapel. Suddenly... The terror gripped me again. The ground beneath my feet seemed to go damp and sticky. I heard the dull sound of the tinkling bells. And by my side stood the headless figure with the white hands. What happened after that I cannot say, except that I fainted. My friend was very solicitous about me but I managed to convince him that my faintness was caused by the close atmosphere inside the chapel. As we were proceeding homewards, my host said, There is a queer story about that chapel. I don't think many people know it, but I have a copy of one of the old books of the hospital in which it is set out in detail. I will let you see it after dinner. You may guess that I was very eager to hear or see anything that might throw some light upon my experiences in the chapel. After the meal, he took me into his study and placed a transcription of a medieval manuscript before me. There, he said, is a copy of the accounts of the almoner of the leper hospital of St. Mary of Pity. The building you have seen today was the Norman chapel of the place, but it was not used after 1298. How was that? I queried. A murder was committed in it, was the blunt reply. A murder so terrible that rather than reconsecrate the building, the monks erected another chapel. Why the old one was never pulled down, I cannot make out. Anyway, it has outlived the new. He touched the manuscript. On page 42 you can read the record of the desecration as the almoner set it down. He left me, and I eagerly settled myself to read the old Norman French writing. Briefly, 
The scribe related how a certain Raymond of Low, a leper, was housed at the hospital. He was a mild and gentle man, and very popular with the brothers. One day a newcomer knocked at the gate. The stranger was a leper from Yorkshire, and the loathsome disease was already turning his brain. For some unaccountable reason, the new guest took a violent dislike to the inoffensive Raymond. No details of the event were given, only the bold statement that at an early mass on the 22nd of June, 1298, the lepers being in the chapel, the newcomer attacked Raymond of Lowe with a sickle, which he had hidden in his robes, and before he could be restrained had, with a tremendous blow, severed his unfortunate victim's head from his body. I closed the book, and as I replaced it on the desk, I seemed to see the whole of that terrible scene. The priest, pale and terror-stricken, crouching by the altar, the tall Yorkshireman held fast by the horrified lepers, and on the front, the headless body with the white hands bent in the agony of death, lying in a pool of blood. About a week ago, an extract from an East Anglian daily paper was sent to me. The report may have some connection with the ghastly apparition in the chapel, and so I reprint it here. Our readers have doubtless watched with interest the restoration and refurnishing of the ancient chapel of the leper hospital of St. Mary of Pity. Much beautiful early Norman work has been brought to light, together with a number of church ornaments. But a discovery made during excavations in the interior of the chapel this week is of exceptional interest. Whilst seeking to find the original level of the floor, a workman struck some hard substance near the entrance to the chancel. Upon investigation, this proved to be the lid of a coffin, which was sunk only a few inches under the floor. In the presence of the authorities, the coffin was raised and the lid removed. Inside was the skeleton of a man, but the skull, instead of being in place, was resting at the feet, and the head had evidently been roughly severed from the body. It would seem that this fact indicated that the bones were those of some state prisoner who had been beheaded, but in the coffin was also found a small brass bell, such as those worn at the neck by lepers. Today's story was The Headless Leper by Frederick Curls. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you for listening. Until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>